through the centuries, human beings have been exploring the unknown. By doing this, we learn more about ourselves and the universe in which we live. During this episode of NASA Biology on Earth and in Space, Dr. Carl Sagan moderates a panel discussion which examines the importance of exploring Mars. This panel session is to uh, make the transition from uh, uh, today to tomorrow, both uh, literally and figuratively. Uh, and we are here to try to discuss in a general way the prospects, likelihood, and pros and cons of sending humans to Mars. Manned exploration is the, uh, the usual way to describe this, but it seems to have a uh, important asymmetry in it in that it excludes half the human species. Uh, but uh, the alternative um, possible phrases like uh, crude missions uh, <laughs> lend themselves to misunderstandings. <laughs> Uh, but, and I, I'm sure everybody will, uh, will find it impossible to avoid slipping into the word man, but it's clear that we, uh, that we mean human beings uh, of both sexes. Uh, the sequence of speakers on the panel uh, will be uh, Dr. Murray, um, Mr. Harvey Meyerson representing Senator Matsunaga, who uh, is at this moment wrestling with the budget. Uh, Dr. Bonet, Dr. Longston, and then uh, hoping that she will arrive before the panel is over, Dr. Sullivan. Uh, the remarks of the panelists are intended to be sufficiently controversial that we will have huge, vigorous fights um, <laughs> on, uh, among the panelists. And then uh, I hope that uh, those of you in the audience will feel free to, uh, to weigh in uh, after about an hour. Uh, that means that I would hope that the panelists would confine their initial remarks to some 10 or 12 minutes each. Our first speaker is Dr. Bruce Murray, who is a professor of geology and planetary sciences at the California Institute of Technology, former uh, director of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, and he was in that role during the uh, successful Viking missions to Mars. And Bruce is also the Vice President of the Planetary Society. Bruce? Thank you, Carl. And it's certainly a pleasure to be here and to see such a really rich kind of set of topics for three days of this conference. I'm, I'm really delighted. It's a testimony to uh, the attractiveness of the topic, Mars, and it's a testimony, I think, to the extraordinary amount of capability, enthusiasm, and energy this country has placed in the direction of Mars such as with Viking, and can do so again in the future. i am uh, thought a lot about this <clears throat> and have concluded, is probably no secret to most of you, that Mars is the planet of the future. And you get to that argument two ways. One is there really aren't many other choices. That environmentally, it's not feasible uh, to send humans to almost any other place in the solar system that's plausible to do. <clears throat> but more importantly, Mars, with the same land area as the Earth, with a, a probably abundant supply of water molecule tied up in its surface materials from which um, life-supporting oxygen and water liquid can be made, uh, with a relatively easy accessibility in terms of the distances one has to transfer humans and, and machines, is really the right place for us to go. So. I don't think it's a question of why humans will, should go to Mars, but only when and under what circumstances. It clearly will happen just as going to Antarctica happened, just as going to the Arctic happened, just as going to the moon. It's only an issue of when and under what circumstances. So strong national self-interest will have to be involved. And the issue is what is that? Well, in the case of the Apollo program in the beginning of the space age, it was competition to demonstrate that country A technology, space technology was superior to country B's, and the implication being that country's A technology in general is superior to country B's. I don't think that's a driving force, certainly not for the United States at the present time. I think our space technology 
uh, is accepted is, is very capable despite the shuttle failures. Um, people take Star Wars quite seriously, which have been an extraordinarily complex set of space technologies. And so I don't think that's the, the issue. I think much more my belief is, especially as we go into the next century, that visible collaboration of major spacefaring nations will be politically desirable and beneficial to the national self-interest of the major spacefaring powers. So I imagine that the, the activity will be highly internationalized. The fact of the matter is that we have a terrible gap in our knowledge about Mars as far as sending either things like sample return vehicles, much less human or humans or ro rovers or anything else. And the gap is that we don't have close-up information and in situ information in some cases from small areas that are widely separated around the planet. Mars is a terrifically big place. It has diverse microenvironments and the like, and we don't have that information. So I predict that as we move into this era of the prospect of human flights, it will become more and more apparent to the major countries involved that that kind of information has to be acquired. Finally, to finish up this sort of preamble and prologue to the larger discussion by the panel, uh, we heard this discussion by Jim French, I thought a really beautifully done one, on the sample return mission, and I came to a, a slightly different conclusion than Jim did listening to it. And I came to the conclusion the sample return mission is not feasible with any existing launch vehicle in any country. That even had the shuttle Centaur survived uh, Challenger, uh, it would have been marginal. And uh, the SL-12, the proton launch vehicle of the Soviet Union, it doesn't even have that capability. So that what it says is that if people are talking about sample return, they're talking about some heavy lift vehicle that does not presently exist. Now, according to Soviet military power, the Defense Department publication, which lists the Soviet boosters, the, the Soviets have two large heavy lift vehicles under development, and one has, has to ask, what are they for? Uh, and I conjecture that one of the things they're for is uh, uh, to do a sample return mission where you have plenty of propellant, plenty of margins, and you do it the, the more or less straightforward engineering way. Um, the second thing you might ask is, well, when? The Soviet Union has had a terrible fascination with energy minima for transfer orbits between the Earth and not just Mars, but also Venus, for example. Um, we're right now at such an opportunity. As you, most of you know, the, the optimum time varies in 15-year cycles. The next one is 15 or 13 years from now when you get there, and that's probably when their planning would show it there. The, the, the point is the launch capability will be easily available by then. The, keep the uh, optimum opportunity will be available by then in terms of energy of transfer. Uh, there's no threat of our doing it before then and removing that as a, as a priority national objective. It kind of fits. So I would just, by this speculation, that's all this is, I have no inside information, but just simply the speculation urge that we really need to sit down and look at the, so the Soviet side of things, especially, as, as well as, as talk as though we were doing all these things unilaterally, or by the way, we might just split off a piece and collaborate. And then hopefully, as involving many other things, formulate a serious Mars exploration strategy. The United States has not done this. The last time that was thought about was back when Jim Martin was landing Viking. And we did some thinking about follow-on, and it's, 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 it's an extinct subject. It needs to be revitalized and, and renewed and uh, looked at with the same degree of sophistication we put into our engineering and we put into our science. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, our second speaker will be Mr. Harvey Meyerson, a uh, principal assistant to Senator Spark Matsunaga of Hawaii. Senator Matsunaga has, uh, among many other distinctions, recently uh, written a book about going to Mars, uh, surely the only U.S. Senator ever to have done so, uh, but I hope, I hope there will be many more. Um, Can we send some? <laughs> First-hand experience can't hurt. Uh, Mr. Meyerson uh, has been uh, deeply involved with uh, the prospect of humans to Mars, is uh, certainly uh, partly responsible for Senator Matsunaga's interest, and it's a pleasure to welcome him to this forum. Harvey? Congress is e e experiencing extreme difficulty right now in dealing 
in responding to rational proposals. <laughs> uh, so uh, it is with this in mind uh, that I'd like to read some prepared remarks with this problem in mind by Senator Matsunaga, uh, uh, which he prepared for uh, today. Uh, as uh, some of you know, uh, my interest in Mars is a bit more compre uh, is manifested in my legislative activities and the rationale for them elaborated in my book, The Mars Project, briefly. I believe a long-term Mars goal of exploration and settlement serves two vital purposes. First, because it is a distant yet attainable goal, it fosters a truly space-age perspective by requiring long-term policies and planning in an outward-looking context. Second, the mere contemplation of that goal, unprecedented in its unfolding immensity, forces the intellect to consider modes of action that are at once globally unifying in their demands on resources and democratizing in the open procedures required for their realization. In effect, a Mars objective internationalizes America's democratic values and procedures on the space frontier. It is thus profoundly in our national interest and it aligns that interest with the long-term requirements of space exploration. The question is, how do we do it? In my view, meaningful steps toward the globally unifying goal of Mars exploration will become possible only after we have achieved unity of purpose within our own divided space establishment. Until that inner unity is attained, policy proposals will merely reflect the preoccupations of competing space interest groups, no matter who's talking. I mentioned that overriding concern by way of introduction to a specific proposal conceived with Mars in mind that I believe could provide the missing foundation for a democratically open, long-term Mars program. We begin with the deeply loved or hated, please check one, space station. Under the inspiration of Werner von Braun, the space station was originally put forward by NASA as a shuttle service low gravity staging base for interplanetary exploration with special reference to Mars. The shuttle lost its identity and compromised its efficiency and safety by taking on numerous other scientific and commercial requirements. Now our space station is following the same route. First it expands, then it shrinks, and always it recedes. The most optimistic date for a U.S. International Space Station is 1996 or 97, a decade from now, by which time the Soviets will probably be building hotels in orbit, while we from the ground <laughs> sniff disdainfully at the quality of their plumbing. <laughs> and I see... But I see one ray of hope. Around 1989, Space Industries Incorporated of Houston which is run by a team of former high-ranking NASA engineers, will launch a single-module, man-tended space station called Space Hat at a cost of between $250 and $500 million, compared to upwards of $11 billion at last count for NASA's receding extravaganza. Space Hat is about the same size as a NASA space station module, but less elaborate. I propose making Space Hat the core of a commercial space complex or CSC, that would include a scaled-down version of the microgravity research module being planned for the NASA International Station. NASA might even contract the job to private industry. Europe and Japan might become involved as well. By 1992, there could be a two or three module man-tended CSC in orbit, representing a mix multi-government and private industry investment of one to two billion dollars. As that happened, a much earlier construction date for the NASA International Facility would become practical with a more sensible function. We might call it the Space Exploration Complex, or SEC. It would consist initially of two or at the most three permanently manned modules. Its initial function would be to carry out the complex long-term research activities that must precede meaningful human exploration of space in such areas as space medicine, gravitational biology, and closed ecological life support systems. Unlike the commercial space complex, where much of the work would be proprietary, the activities of this SEC would be open in keeping with already established practice for life sciences research. Hopefully, arrangements would be concluded for the SEC to have communications and docking compatibilities 
with the orbiting Soviet station or stations to facilitate astronaut rescue in the event of emergency and to permit useful exchanges of research information. Safety agreements might even be worked out whereby a transport vehicle was always docked at one of the stations, prepared to respond to life-threatening emergencies at either one. Under the CSCSEC format, we could thus have in orbit by 1992 the cores of two space station complexes, several years ahead of the currently planned U.S. International Station at less than half its cost. The commercial space complex would evolve towards space industry, the space exploration complex toward exploration. There would be some overlap, of course, but the distinctive character of the two installations would prevent the sort of mission confusion that has bedeviled NASA for nearly two decades. The business of NASA would henceforth consist of pathfinding activities that offer no economic return, but that are essential for long-term economic development, like highways and harbors on the ground. At the same time, industry would acquire the base in space it needs to realize its potential. The Europeans and the Japanese could also be expected to find the new arrangement far more satisfying for the same reasons as we would, plus a few others. Under current rules, use of the U.S. International Station will be determined by the proportion of a participant's investment, which means that the Japanese may get to use their $1 billion module 6% of the time. Negotiations can change that, but not by much because the principle is legitimate. The best way to redress the balance is to reduce the U.S. investment for initial operating capability, which we do by allocating functions to two less complicated and more flexible facilities. Now we stop making enemies of our friends and become partners with them. Now where does all this leave us as far as Mars is concerned? Very close. Funding for the two space stations and the replacement orbiter would be completed by 1992, just in time to accommodate a far more modest surge for the 1996 Mars sample return that is integral to this proposal. I have been advised that if a sample return mission is carried out on an international basis, the U.S. contribution would be limited to about $2 billion, spread over 10 years, with no more than $400 million during any peak year. The space station and a Challenger replacement already accommodated at a multi-billion dollar saving, U.S. leadership in an international Mars sample return becomes a very affordable option that also serves our foreign policy interests. The international Halley mission, which the Soviets led, was a huge success and has induced them to be far more aggressive in the international cooperation arena in the absence of balancing U.S. initiatives. But we could turn that around by grasping a unique opportunity to use the 10th anniversary year of Viking, 1986, to call for an international Mars sample return launched in Viking's 20th anniversary year, 1996. Such a commitment would capture some of the drama of Apollo at a fraction of its cost. Our mission contribution would be launched from a space station. The returning sample might wind up in a space station back contamination laboratory before shuttle brought it to Earth. I offer this proposal today informally as a possible topic for reflection and perhaps discussion at a time when key decisions on shuttle and space station are being made. It is inspired in large measure by a crying need to give unified purpose to our shuttle, space station, and space science activities. <laughs> scope them to meet budgetary requirements, stop squabbling, and start moving. That, to my mind, is the best path to human exploration of Mars or any other meaningful objective in space. Thank you. Thank you, uh, both Mr. Meyerson and uh, Senator Matsunaga. <laughs> it's an excellent joint paper. <laughs> um, our next speaker is Dr. Roger Bonnet who is director of the space science program of ESA, the European Space Agency, in Paris, and uh, who did uh, so extraordinary a job in the uh, remarkably successful Giotto encounter uh, within a few hundred kilometers of the nucleus of Halley's Comet uh, last March. Welcome, Roger. Thank you, Carl. It would be very difficult to compete with such an enlightening uh, speech uh, as my predecessor has done, uh, working in the very complex environment of uh, Europe. Uh, 
When I heard today about the difficulty of driving a rover on Mars, I think this is extremely simple as compared to driving uh, the program of a consortium of 13 nations, uh, which uh, have uh, all different private interests. Uh, you had gray hairs. Uh, I have also my gray hairs, and I think uh, <coughs> we, we both drive some uh, different uh, vehicles, and uh, they are difficult to drive. But uh, I am hopeful that uh, in the future we will uh, be successful. Let me come back to uh, what uh, the Europeans uh, might think. I say might think because I don't think there has been a lot of uh, uh, deep uh, assessment of uh, manned mission on Mars in, in Europe. Uh, first of all, I must say that uh, the science which uh, has been identified for both uh, a Mars mission and a Mars sample return mission and probably a manned mission on Mars, although this has to be assessed more carefully, is outstanding and undisputable at this, at this stage. Um, I think, however, that a Mars sample return mission is, is a necessity, is a must, and will probably uh, be a necessary step uh, toward what I consider personally as unavoidable uh, manned uh, mission to Mars. I will come back uh, later on when such a mission could be foreseen in my own personal view. Uh, but certainly an automated uh, mission to planet Mars should come first, not only for preparing the uh, technology, uh, but also to uh, prepare the uh, landing sites and where to go uh, for man later. Now let me speak a little bit about uh, international aspects of this, because it is my feeling uh, that uh, if uh, this is considered as a national priority, the Soviet Union and the United States can do such missions by themselves. Uh, I think uh, they have proven uh, in both uh, countries, it has been proven that uh, the necessary effort once deblocked by the political power uh, can be used efficiently to make uh, great uh, ventures uh, on the moon or in uh, planetary exploration. And in that respect, uh, I think that uh, the Americans have uh, advanced very far the technology on going to Mars, much uh, further, in fact, than uh, the Soviets have, although the Soviets are certainly uh, preparing a strategy of uh, exploration of Mars, which will uh, certainly end up with uh, human exploration of Mars uh, later on. Uh, according to the Soviets, uh, this uh, could be uh, probably not before uh, 2025, 2030 or something like that. But this is uh, private information. So um, this uh, requires uh, national priorities. However, I think that in the present state of uh, the uh, space programs, especially in the Western world, the reassessment of these priorities will be difficult, and uh, it is uh, interesting to read that uh, these books, which were published uh, five or six years ago, not very long ago, about uh, what would happen at the end of this century, and uh, colonies of one million people in space were foreseen, flights of 52 shuttle per year were foreseen, and you see where we are now. Uh, another interesting aspect of this, uh, uh, which we are uh, looking at, and uh, it's certainly the cheapest way of uh, looking at the preparation of colonization of, of, of Mars, is the, the philosophical aspects of that. Space Agency thinks mostly of hardware uh, and of uh, uh, preparing experiments, but uh, there are philosoph philosophical aspects in, in a future international venture of that kind, uh, like, for example, what kind of society will the uh, uh, the people on the surface of Mars live uh, in? Uh, will it be a free enterprise uh, society? Will it be a communist society? Uh, and there are uh, several interesting aspects of that to be studied. Um, the uh, other aspect is uh, w whether uh, you will uh, choose uh, uh, what kind of selection of astronauts will you, will you make? Uh, will they be all white? Uh, will they be all yellow? Or a mixture of them, like more, most likely? That's a very uh, interesting question to, uh, to assess on these big scale ventures. But uh, this is another aspect which uh, ought to be looked at, and we are organizing, the European Space Agency is organizing next January with uh, an organization which is obscure to most of you, as it was to me before I knew it existed uh, last year, uh, with the uh, European University of Philosophy, we are organizing a colloquium on the uh, 
philosophy of the space conquest, uh, space conquest identifying these various, uh, these various aspects, uh, like uh, uh, also the notion of progress for the people who will be on Mars. Will the progress be uh, to go back to Earth or to go to another planet or to do something, something else? Um, I think all this is very exciting. And uh, I must say that uh, I would like to thank very much uh, the NASA and uh, the Academy to have given us the opportunity to be here and to express uh, some of these, of these viewpoints. We are not at this stage extremely uh, constructive because, as I said, it's not easy to uh, foster and to focus on a common objective. But uh, with your help and with a good climate, which is a necessity, in my opinion, uh, between uh, the two superpowers on this peaceful exploration of space, we can uh, approach this uh, endeavor with uh, great optimism, and uh, I think the Europeans will be more ha uh, than happy to participate in that, and I am myself uh, pushing for this, uh, for this venture. Thank you for having joined us. In our next program, we will continue the panel discussion about possible exploration of Mars. Until then, this is Lynn Bondrand in Cleveland saying goodbye from the NASA Lewis Research Center. In our last episode of NASA Biology on Earth and in Space, Dr. Carl Sagan moderated a panel discussion about the exploration of Mars. During this program, the discussion continues where we left off. Uh. Our next uh, speaker is Dr. Catherine Sullivan uh, of the Johnson Space Center. Uh, Dr. Sullivan uh, just lately returned from the Senate, <laughs> um, is here just on time. Uh, she uh, is a member of the National Commission on Space, which is what she was testifying about, both in the House and the Senate today. And she's also the first American woman to have walked in space. Yeah. Thank you, Carl. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. I, I regret that my duties with the National Commission over the past two days have prevented me from taking part in more of the sessions here looking at the program. I know there was uh, quite a wealth of good technical and scientific exchange, and I hope some uh, considerable progress in everybody's thinking in and, and optimism towards the very exciting idea that this conference has been convened to address namely the exploration of Mars by both robotic and uh, eventually manned missions. Uh, I'd like to primarily confine my comments today uh, for the purpose of information of those who perhaps are not familiar with the work that's been done by the National Commission on Space to our report and where it stands uh, at present. The National Commission on Space was established uh, formally impaneled in March of 1985, actually, by an act of the U.S. Congress and by appointment of the President to define the goals and opportunities and challenges that lie ahead in the civilian space arena for the United States. Uh, and after due trial and tribulation, I can assure you, not to mention careful study, much deliberation, and and soliciting the opinions of virtually everyone that we could think of, including the uh, various officials and technical people at NASA, captains of the aerospace industry, many of the current and would-be entrepreneurs in the space frontier, and several hundred, or if not a few thousand, day-to-day uh, -day American citizens in 15 cities throughout the country, we produced this report called Pioneering the Space Frontier, and available, and I hope of interest to many of you here, uh, our purpose in creating a report of this sort and packaging and presenting it in this sort was precisely to contribute to the debate on these longer term goals that we have presented that we have advocated the United States undertake for itself and that are the focal point for the uh, conference sessions this week at the Academy. <coughs> there's been a, <coughs> pardon me, there's been a tendency I think in uh, the media reviews of our report to fall into the typical pattern of opening to the chapters that tell about all the neat spaceships and tinker toys and bits of hardware that you will need uh, over some period of time costing some amount of dollars and wonder and worry about whether any of that's worthwhile or could be done. 
I'd like to direct your attention to a few other aspects of the report. They are the aspects that were uh, most important to us, the commissioners, and that we have been emphasizing most strongly to the House and Senate subcommittees today as we presented the report in formal testimony. And I'm pleased to add, and I, and I hope it hasn't been canceled during my taxi ride down from the Senate office building, uh, but at the same time that the report is being discussed here, I am pleased to add that our Chairman Dr. Tom Payne and Vice Chairman Dr. Laura Wilkening are in fact presenting the report to the President at the White House uh, also for his consideration. That event was a long time coming and I hope it will help uh, focus and clarify the, the direction and some of the activity that may emerge from the report's uh, presentation. An often overlooked part of the report funny enough, begins on page three. It must be too far in the front of the book to be commonly regarded. Um, and it is innocuously titled Rationale for Exploring and Settling the Solar System. Uh, we basically recognized early on in our deliberations that the, the physical milestones within the inner, inner solar system that one can conceive of uh, studying and undertaking for human exploration robotically or by direct uh, participation are, of course, fairly limited. It's a bit too cold on Mercury. It's a bit too hot on Venus. Uh, similarly close at hand, but with much greater promise, although they all pose their own challenges in terms of representing harsh environments, are the Moon and Mars. And those two bodies have been uh, widely discussed over a number of years as having some potential that we think we, in some small measure, have an initial understanding of to, pro to provide in situ resources and the capability to perhaps truly settle there, truly move elements at least of human civilization to those bodies for a long time frame. Uh, and thus our cornerstone in our rationale for going forth back to the moon and on to Mars was what we recognized to be a, an imperative and an inevitable tendency for civilization ultimately to move off of this planet perhaps initially for the purpose of operating a radio telescope on the far side of the moon, perhaps initially for the purpose of determining uh, whether you can indeed create construction materials in large volumes out of lunar materials in situ, uh, perhaps for a variety of other reasons, in the same way that historically on the American western frontier or the frontiers of civilization in other vast nations, uh, it's been difficult to predict exactly which immediate motives would take somebody beyond the current horizon of the cleared area and lead them to clear a new chunk of the forest and start some new endeavor. So it's difficult today to know just what it will be that will unlock the key to our movement off of this planet. But we became convinced early on that that is a, a tendency, it is a trend, it is an imperative that, that will not be denied and that will ultimately find expression. The scientific reasons for doing that are today, as they have been for decades, clear and compelling. The techniques with which we had addressed those scientific challenges are, of course, more advanced today than they were in the days of Schiaparelli or Tsiolkovsky, but they're nevertheless very much the same. And in almost every respect, all of these advanced exploration scenarios are technically so near at hand, they're tantalizingly near. Unfortunately, they seem politically to be extremely far away, and that's where the major challenge undoubtedly lies. Uh, in an effort to elaborate on this rationale with a little more detail, a little more concrete detail, we hoped, uh, we landed upon three primary elements that we felt were valid motivations, valid underpinnings to a civilian space activity. It, uh, it proves a little difficult, as Carl and I both discovered this morning in addressing the House Subcommittee on Space Science and Applications, to persuade people confronted with a plethora of alligators, most of whom are gobbling up money, that one should explore for some what they perceive to be vague moral imperative. Um, I suspect Queen, maybe Queen Isabella had a little bit easier time on the imperative of converting the heathens, but I suspect she really didn't. We probably just haven't had all the deliberations recorded in our history books. But at any rate, uh, happily enough, I think it is very fairly straightforward to point out that there are a variety of direct practical side effects to any nation that participates in such an advanced and compelling technological endeavor uh, for civilian and peaceful purposes. And the code words that we applied in some attempt to organize these thoughts in our report uh, were that civilian space enterprises should proceed for three main reasons. One could be broadly summed under the word science. Uh, 
Another could be broadly summed under the term exploration. And finally, you could identify a broad category of enterprise. The scientific and exploration categories are ones we've worked in, dabbled in, had sterling successes and occasional failures in over many, many years. Enterprise is really a nascent sector that many people have fond hopes for or great dreams for, but that we currently have very little direct practical experience in and very little concrete wisdom with which to guide many of our endeavors. In all of these areas, uh, we tend to go through a succession of steps from precursor missions of various sorts and in the exploration of the solar system. There are first robotic precursors, often first flybys. On the moon we then had, on the moon and Mars we've then had landers, and on the moon finally we had manned uh, scientific stations for brief periods, including manned rovers. And in each of these cases, historically and in the future, I think the key uh, has been and will be designing the proper mixture and interface of men and machines and determining the proper points in time in terms of the evolution of our knowledge and our experience at which to phase amongst the, the different levels of, of effort and the purely robotic and on to the demand uh, side of things. We did assume very clearly that manned activities would follow and that flowed from our initial premise that this imperative to ultimately settle other worlds uh, is the fundamental and if you will almost revolutionary underlying precept that not only the United States but the other nations of the world should recognize. The key for the United States, I think, uh, in bridging this gap between what is technologically so near and politically so far away, the key is commitment. Uh, I think not as a stunt and not in any sense to be exclusive or uh, uh, arrogant about U.S. abilities, but simply because it is so important for the United States to be and to remain an active player in all of these fields. It's important for the motivation and excellence of our own academic and technical communities. It's important, I think, for the economic competitiveness of many sectors of our society on into the 21st century. Uh, and it's important to be a substantive and meaningful and reliable partner uh, one among many, perhaps a leader in some areas, perhaps not in others, but a, a, an important and substantive partner among the many players that I think we are seeing now and will see in the future uh, on the space frontier. We had a, let me digress just briefly, uh, to why it is important in times like these to have something like this volume, I think, before the people of the United States and indeed the world. We've had a lot of interest from the uh, directors and members of the European Space Agency and a number of our other international colleagues in this report. And I think the reason is that uh, in the United States today, despite the fact that the economy and the space program seem to be in, in fairly devastating chaos at the moment, uh, that in fact it is nevertheless important to have something that looks this broad and general and bold before you. Uh, it is not the case that you should take this and because it is too glossy and has too much color in it and so forth, put it on the shelf until later when life is easier. But rather it is precisely because this gives you the general sense of direction that it can help you uh, solve some of the very immediate and pressing problems that, that we in the United States and specifically the Congress and NASA have in front of us. Uh, I think we have a number of very important small hooks in this report into which we can attach current efforts today, current steps today, current decisions about how to recover from our launch vehicle debacle of recent months and begin to revitalize and reinvigorate our scientific and technical fields in order to be poised to take full advantage of and be a full participant in the exciting future that we envisioned on the National Commission and that you've been talking about in the last several days. Uh, you can, if you can, adopt some or all of this report or any other general outline as your basic roadmap. You also then have a standard or a set of criteria against which to judge each proposed project on some meritorious basis. How well does this project help me accomplish this larger goal? Uh, you can elevate your, both the internal debates and the international negotiations above some of the subsidiary levels of uh, a mere national interest or a mere uh, local political 
activity and determine that it has some merit in a broader scheme of things. That's still difficult to do because it is still a, a human process and human beings are not always perfectly objective, as I'm sure we all know, but it gives you some tool to work with and I think it's a valuable one. Finally, uh, and something that is of importance on the current political horizon as well, I think we need to keep in mind as we talk about our favorite topic, which is specifically how do we go to Mars with what vehicles and what sequence, I think it's incumbent on all of us taking part in, in that adventure to look for and understand and to the degree we can contribute to the diffusion of our experience and our new techniques developed for these uh, planetary exploratory purposes, keep in mind how they can be applied rapidly and quickly to the solution of problems here on Earth. Uh, I think that's a social responsibility for all scientists that we perhaps across the board have been a little remiss in over a number of years. It is certainly one that we must keep in mind if we are to have some credibility among the people that have to make very tough budgetary decisions and determine which investments they should make today to give the greatest advantage to their constituents at home. And in that regard, when one considers something like sending human beings to Mars, for example, I think several things come immediately to mind. One, one would be that if we truly can master the technologies, the science and the technologies of providing a stable, healthy, closed-loop life support system for human beings involving animal protein, growth of plants, oxygen, water recirculation, waste material recirculation, circulation, then I'm sure we will see spinning off of that very readily a variety of control technologies, agricultural techniques, uh, biochemical understanding in the, in the vein of fertilizers and nutrient solutions, all of which may be directly applicable to better agricultural practices and higher productivity uh, in stressed regions on Earth, for example. Similarly, the point of providing health care, which uh, Dr. Bonet brought up in his remarks, uh, I think very readily could be expected to generate a number of spin-offs in terms of health care techniques, tools, or new perspectives for direct use uh, in surgical operating rooms and hospitals and medical care facilities here on the ground. We need to believe that is true. We need to help make those spin-offs be true if we're to have any credibility among the people who will, uh, in essence, be staying here on Earth and looking for our endeavors to provide some direct benefits uh, back on the ground. I'm probably not as optimistic as some of the other members of the panel. Uh, what I would call the idealistic hope that encapsulating four or six or eight people of varied nations in a, a small tin can and sending them off to another planet would have some magical and far-reaching uh, effect on the international psychologies involved. I certainly think that just the ability to accomplish that and to subordinate other rivalries or problems or disagreements during the period of time it took to safely and successfully accomplish that mission would be an extraordinarily important and significant demonstration of the ability to put some of our differences aside. But I would have to submit, in, just as a final comment, that we do need to be careful, I think, to not presume it will have some magical transforming effect throughout all of society. That, I'm sure, will not be the case, but I think it would pose us all a great challenge that would return to our scientific communities and, the, and mankind at large great benefits and certainly offer us a very clear imperative to uh, put our differences aside for a period and prove that we could do that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. Our final panelist is Dr. John Logsdon, the Director of Graduate Programs in Science, Technology, and Public Policy at George Washington University and a uh, distinguished historian of the space program. John? Thank you, Carl. I argue, sure, the kind of commitment that can make the, the visions that are being talked about in this conference happen can be achieved through this and other political systems, not easily and not by you, not by the people in this hall. Uh, you're the necessary but not the sufficient condition. I wrote a book uh, too long ago now, since I should do another one, called The Decision to Go to the Moon. Uh, and, and 
Apollo 25 years ago this year, the Kennedy commitment to Apollo. It's kind of an obvious example of, of, of a country committing itself to a large-scale enterprise, but maybe a misleading uh, example. It was a product of a very specific situation, and, and waiting for that situation to come around again may make people wait a long time. Uh, President Kennedy the first defined the national interest as requiring U.S. preeminence in space, then asked for, and I'm quoting his request, a space program that promises dramatic results in which we could win. Uh, so the first thing was the objective, U.S. preeminence. Uh, going to the moon was really a means to a broader end, and it's linking the space visions to some broader set of purposes, human purposes, I think is a point. The answer when Kennedy asked that question in 1961 was sending humans to the moon, sending men to the moon, primarily because it was a rocket building contest. Uh, neither the Soviets nor the United States then had the launch capabilities uh, to, uh, to do a, a, a manned lunar mission. I heard, I guess with Bruce, earlier say that at this point neither the United States or the Soviet Union has the capability for doing sample return or larger missions, so maybe this, there is some parallel in the situation. What can people here and like-minded people do to create a situation in which a, a future leader asks questions to which the answer is the exploration and settlement of Mars? Has it been done in the last 15 minutes, perhaps? As, as the Commission's report has been presented to President Reagan. It's, it's important to remember that we have been down this road before. In September of 1969, a president was presented with a vision of a long-term future in space aimed at uh, human landings on Mars before the end of the century. So that was about a 30-year plan. Uh, when, do, when do you call for the first landing, Kathy? About 30? Oh, hmm? 2015. 2015, so 30 about 30 years. Let's hope in 2015 we're not putting out a report that calls for a 2045 landing. <laughs> uh, in, in, in preparing uh, in 1969 uh, for the recommendations to the president on long-term visions in space, a, a highly placed elected leader uh, made the following statements, which I think could be made today maybe were in fact made today by Mr. Payne. Uh, I, I quote, when I consider the potential of a manned spaceflight to Mars, and I recognize many cogent arguments counter it, I conceive it as the possible overture to a new era of civilization. Would we want to answer through eternity for turning back a Columbus or a Magellan? Would we be denying the people of the world the enlightenment and evolution which accompany every great age of discovery? Nice quote. That's Spiro T. Agnew. Uh, I would wager Dr. Payne did not use those words. <laughs> Let's hope not, because he heard them that time, too. Uh, right, let's think a little bit collectively in, in the discussion of what kind of rationale, what kind of ideas can come out of this group and others to provide the underpinning to draw the commitment out of the political system that all of us want. Um, do you need a crisis? I mean, could Mr. Reagan get up tomorrow or at the summit or any other time and say we're going to do this and make it happen, or do, do we have to be forced into it? Can we do it without competition? I don't have answers to those. Clearly you need an infrastructure and you need technical feasibility. I think we assume that. One of the things that I haven't heard in the short time I've been able to be here, and it's typical of these kind of meetings, is any consideration of the opposition. Uh, you know, where's the red team that comes in and looks at our proposals and says, how do we bulletproof them? Uh, how do we talk to the other parts of the scientific community that says it'll take money away from the super colliding conductor, uh, or the environmentalists who say you'll screw up a pristine environment uh, on another planet, or uh, the people who say it's all a military front. Uh, we have to work on understanding the opposition and having good answers, not, uh, no, 
we have some superior knowledge. Um, all of that suggests that to me that, that there isn't a clear, neat, one rationale, easy answer to the question of how to link political commitment to visions. It's something that has to be worked at, and it has to be worked at, first of all, by the people that believe in it. That's the role of, of the scientists, the engineers, the advocates that are represented in this group. Um, decisions to build, a, begin a large-scale program are very much a product of a specific time, a specific place, and specific people. Most of those people that will make going to Mars happen are in this room now. What they and we have to do is expand the ranks uh, and get the people with the resources, the power, the access to opinion to join us in what I agree with Bruce Murray is a piece of human inevitability. Thank you. Humankind's quest for knowledge and understanding requires a willingness to take risks and to reach for things just beyond our grasp. Then real progress can be made. The international exploration of Mars is a goal that could be achieved, and it is a goal that could benefit all human beings. <laughs>